Hi, I'm Jason Mears, and this is NSXT with Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, or TKG. And this is the more detailed version of a previous video where we'll go into uh, more products and features. So in previous videos, um, we showed you this diagram, which was uh, vSphere 7. Uh, with Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, so a hypervisor that can also run containers and Kubernetes. Um, and we explained that we can run our traditional virtual machines on top here. And we've got visibility of things like port groups and VLANs, um, network cards, uplinks, switches, firewalls, routers, all the usual stuff. And we talked about the fact that when you deploy containers and Kubernetes on top of this hypervisor with a container runtime, we solved the problem of running everything on one platform but there's this um, hidden network around the back or this flat network around the back, which has no security and no visibility for the VI administrator here. And we talked about the fact that it, um, one of the things we can do with NSX is we can replace this container networking with NSX networking so that that disappears. Those containers are dropped on NSX networks and now we have uh, consistency across the board. We have a single way or a single place of managing those networks, but more importantly, we've got proper visibility, proper security, and we've got policies as well that we can apply to things. So the, the network administrator can be sure that we've not got anything going around the back of these networks. Let me just go back here. Because it's possible for traffic on one of these containers to talk directly to any of the others and anything that's built in future, there's a possibility for data to leak around the back or, or be unseen by us. So again, this, this replacing that with NSX is what we talked about in a previous video. So we're going to go into more depth on that concept. But before we do that, I just want to talk about overlay networks and underlay networks before we dive into that next level of detail. So if we've got our hypervisor with a container runtime, and we've got our virtual machine sat on top of that, and we've got our uh, traditional network in here, so network cards, switches, firewalls, and routers, it will be common to call that the underlay network. So if you can if you can physically touch it, it's real hardware. Most people would refer to that as an underlay network. If they then use software defined networking to sit on top of that, or in the hypervisor as the overlay network. So we've got a hardware network, the underlay network, and we've got a software defined network, the NSX, which lots of it's quite common to call this in the in the industry an overlay network. What we can do with that is NSX can provide services in software inside the hypervisor for switching, routing, network address translation, load balancing, firewalling, and possibly even more important than all of those things is the actual visibility of seeing what's going on that network um, so you know where the traffic is going to and from and what's sending and receiving it. So um, that's the stuff that NSX can do, and we're going to talk now about how we can also deploy those same NSX software tools and services to these containers sat up here on top of a container runtime and, and replace that hidden network around the back that's a flat network with no security, no visibility with something like NSX so that we can now deploy modern applications, things like containers, Kubernetes and all the products under the Tanzu portfolio using this common uh, model or common set of tools. So before we jump into that a little bit further, I'm going to describe the um, OSI seven layer model and the day in life of a packet. And what I will say is this is this is very much an oversimplification for people who are not familiar with this model. If you are a networking professional or a security professional, um, I would uh, ask you to turn your eyes away here or um, um, look away. You'll be horrified at the oversimplification I do here. This is purely for people who don't, who aren't familiar with this seven layer model and what it does. So the oversimplified version of the OSI seven layer model, and I'm going to use an envelope um, uh, or a packet um, to just to explain this to give you kind of a similes between a, a postal network with envelopes or a, a computer network with packets and data. So we're going to start off with this envelope or packet that contains data or information. And if I want to send this data or this packet to somebody, let's go with the envelope analogy first. If I want to send this to somebody who lives on the same street as me or the same town as me, what I might do is just deliver that myself directly. I might walk down the street and post it, or I might just um, you know, walk, walk to somebody's house or um, drive there in the car and just post it directly. So because that 
person lives in the same postcode or zip code or vicinity, um, I just deliver it directly. And the same thing happens with computer networking. If I want to send some data to a machine which is on the same subnet as me or the same area as me, I can just send that directly. It's simpler and easier for me to do that, is just to send it directly. And in the computer world, um, that's, that's what we call switching, and we send that at layer two. Now, if I want to send a, a letter or a parcel or a packet or an envelope to somebody else who lives in a different postcode or zip code or town, I might send that to the post office and the post office can route that envelope um, to the desired recipient. So if it's not close enough for me to send it direct, I send it to a post office or for routing. And the same happens with computer networking. If I have a packet that I want to send to a computer in a different postcode or a different zip code or a different region or a different town, I send that through a router. So this is my packet or my envelope and I can switch it or I can route it. Switching is what we call layer two, routing is what we call layer three. So just an example, kind of say an example of, uh, you know, using an analogy of a letter or an envelope to computer networking. The next thing that we've got is something called network address translation. And this is where the public address is different than the real address. And you can think of this as being like a, a PO box or a post office box or a mailing address that, that doesn't actually contain the recipient's real home address. It's just somewhere you can send mail to, like, a, like say a mailing address, or we call it in the UK, a PO box, a post office box. And that's a, a, a bit similar to something we call NAT, where there's a a public address and a real address. It's called network address translation. There's also another variation of that called port address translation. And that's primarily a layer three service, but it does involve layer four at some point. So I've, I've put them both in there, but this is called NAT. The next thing we get to is when, when we've got lots and lots of traffic, it's unfeasible for one a postal worker to be able to do all of this. So we need multiple postal workers. We might need postal workers on bicycles or cars or vans. And this is where we're doing things at scale. When we've got so many envelopes or packets or parcels, we might need a load balancer to spread that out between multiple delivery people. Um, so that's what we call load balancing. And that's, I'm gonna say just for this part of the video, that's layer four. I'm gonna expand on it and show you how we get to layer seven next. But for now, let's just assume that we look at the um, information on the envelope and we make decisions about how to deliver it based on what it says on the outside of the envelope. And we can do the same thing with security. If there's some things you can and can't send through the mail, um, we need to do firewalling to decide whether that uh, packet or that envelope or that traffic is allowed to be sent. And again, at layer four, we look on the outside of the envelope and based on what it says is inside the envelope, we make decisions about whether or not we are allowed to deliver that packet or that data or that information. So they typically start at layer four, but we are trusting what it, what it says it is and who we say it's going to by looking at the outside of the packet. When we move to things like layer seven, so load balancing can be you know, between layer four and layer seven, and firewalling can be between layer four and layer seven. The difference between them, or the main difference between them, is that when we get to layer seven, we actually open up the packet and we look specifically what's inside. So we don't believe what it says on the outside of the envelope or the packet. We open up the packet and we inspect the contents to decide if it really has come from that person or really is going to that person or that service and whether the contents really are what they say they are and whether it's allowed to be sent. So this is where we go from reading the outside of the packet to doing what we call packet inspection. And you'll actually see uh, in the industry, you'll hear something called packet inspection or deep packet inspections, particularly on firewalls. And that just means that instead of just believing what the packet says it is, we actually open it up and look at the contents. So. Again, it's, this is not meant to be the most technical description. It's just to give you an idea that um, when we're moving envelopes and parcels or packets of data, there are several things that need to be done and they all work at different layers. Um, the next one on from here is, um, it's not part of the OSR layer, but visibility of what's going on. So my point here really is, when we, whether we're delivering envelopes uh, or packets of data, we need all these features and functions at different levels. And in computer terms, it's called the OSI model. So when we hear people talking about the OSI layers or layer two to layer seven services, this is a, a very simple explanation of what all that stuff is. And we need to know that 
as we move on to the next section where we'll describe how all those services are made up from NSX in its entirety um, if you go down the NSX route or how it's made up from uh, lots of different products if you go down an alternate route. So let's start here. vSphere with Tanzu, ESXi, containers and Kubernetes. We're going to build our virtual machines here and we're going to build our containers here. So still on the same hypervisor and still with the um, hypervisor with a container runtime, most likely Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, we've still got this flat network or hidden network around the back, which we can't do any security or visibility on using traditional tools. And what we're going to say is that for these virtual machines here, we're going to use NSX to provide all those services between layer 2 and layer 7, the ones we just described on the slide before. So things like switching and routing, things like network address translation and load balancing, and things like firewalling and things like visibility. So it's dead easy on the on the VM side of things because we've uh, we've had this kind of stuff for years. But if we want to do something on this container side of things, um, traditionally what you'll find is that you'll use various products to provide all these services that operate between layer two and layer seven. And I'm going to list some of the most common ones that you may already have heard of. So something called Flannel, something called Calico, um, uh, a proxy called Envoy, uh, HA Proxy, Open vSwitch, Istio, and uh, this is uh, Nginx uh, Ingress Gateway. So lots of different products that do all of this. And actually, I forgot what this one was. I had to uh, do a little bit of research. And I, I found 26 other networking products that can fit in here before I actually figured out what that was and remembered that it was the ingress controller of Nginx. So there's certainly lots to pick from here, but um, these are probably the most common ones you see. And some of these overlap on what each other one does. Um, the other thing to mention here is it's not always obvious picking which ones are going to be the successful ones or which ones are going to win or which ones are going to survive. And the reason I say that is for a long time, the most popular or the best known of these are Flannel and Calico. And there was a project started four years ago to merge Flannel and Calico into a new uh, project called Canal. So Canal was going to be that merging of Calico and Flannel. Um, and everybody thought that that was going to be the successor and a, you know, the way forward. What actually happened was about two years ago, um, there was um, disagreement about how that was going to be done. Um, and Project Canal, as far as I can tell, has been abandoned. And we now go back to using um, uh, Flannel and Calico independently. So that looked like it was going to be a successful project, but actually has been abandoned two years ago. Was this one here, Envoy, uh, developed by the ride-sharing company Lyft, L-Y-F-T, a little bit like Uber. And this project... Um, has, has taken off so much that there's now 600 developers working on this worldwide. But you would have expected that this would be the one that was successful and this one wouldn't have been heard of. Um, the other things that you sometimes see is things like this one here, Aspen Mesh. It's actually a variation of Istio where the developers that were working on Istio decided to start their own, uh, what we call a fork of that and go off in a different direction and create a new product that does the same kind of thing. So again, there's, there's, um, there's less predictability around here and certainly more complexity. So one of the things we talk about with NSX is that instead of having all these different products doing all those layer two to layer seven services, what we can do is we can uh, get rid of that network around the back. We can get rid of these products and we can do all of the layer two and layer seven services for virtual machines and containers with one product with NSX. So we can use the same. We can do switching, routing, NAT, load balancing, firewall, visibility, exactly the same way as we do for virtual machines. And again, most important bit is this visibility. We can see what's going on and we can secure it. And it's a, it's a logical way to do it. It's the way that we've been doing it for a while. So that's how NSX can be used in containers and Kubernetes to replace those uh, numerous other products. Uh, and what I'm gonna do um, next is I'm going to show you that actually once you've started doing that with NSX and you, you get more and more containers deployed on your platform, one of the things that people start to look at next when they're doing lots and lots of containers and lots and lots of microservices is they look towards doing something called a service mesh. And just to let you know that NSX also has um, a service mesh called 
imaginatively NSX service mesh. So once you get to the point where your containers are outnumbering your VMs or you've got lots and lots of containers and lots and lots of microservices, there is also a way of doing a service mesh with NSX2 in a way that's familiar to your um, existing administrators and existing IT department. So what I'm going to do now do next is a worked example and I want to show you how this actually looks because it's all well well and good me telling you that you can do this but I, I much prefer learning from pictures and I want to show you how you would actually deploy this in real life and what it would mean for the developer. So let's just start mapping out again a little bit first. Wherever you see this symbol here this is going to be a physical router so a piece of equipment you can touch on your network. The next thing we're going to do is an NSX T0 router. So this is a software defined router and the T0 type router is very good at talking to physical routers and doing things like router advertisement with things like BGP. So this is the bit, the software component that talks to the outside world. Uh, we've also got something called an NSX tier 1 router and traditionally tier 1 routers are connected to tier 0 routers and the uh, the workload or the namespace that we're going to create underneath it. So the next thing is we're going to have a namespace that's got containers or deployments underneath. So all these uh, containers or this deployment is going to talk to a tier 1 router which talks to a tier 0 router which then advertises all these networks out to a physical router or a hardware router on the outside. It is actually possible to connect these namespaces and containers and deployments directly to a tier zero if you want to, but most of our customers like having this tier one router that sits between them. So they'll have lots of these tier one routers and deployments connected to a single tier one router normally. But uh, I'm just going to map out how we're going to do this. And once we've got that namespace with containers or deployments inside it, this is where we do the other things like switching and NAT and PAT and load balancing and firewalling. You'll notice here that we've got a firewall on this deployment uh, and the things like visibility. So I'm really just showing you what the icons and the shapes we're going to use are here and that this is physical router, this is a software tier 0 router, software tier 1 router that connects all that subnet firewall rules, containers, deployments and all these other things to the bottom. So we're actually going to start and show you, I'm going to do you two worked examples just to show you how this can be done and we're going to show you what the developer would type in or how, how this works. Um, in their day-to-day -day life. So this example number one, I'm going to show you two physical routers in Active Active. I'm going to stick a single NSX tier zero router underneath it. I'm going to have two NSX tier one routers get underneath that and we're going to connect that to multiple containers or deployments um, under that um, using a tier one router each. So let's start with this. There's my two physical routers. Um, I'm going to create a, a, a single Tier the NSX tier zero router. So this is the software defined tier zero router that talks to the two physical ones. What we're then going to do is create a namespace. The developers typed here, kubectl create namespace foo. That's as soon as we create that namespace, that's going to create a tier one router connected to the tier zero to tier zero router, and we're going to have a subnet created underneath that. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to create another namespace, uh, namespace called bar. And we're going to have a new tier one router connected to the tier zero router connected to the physical routers. So I've now got two namespaces, each have their own tier one router connected to a tier zero router, just by using the normal kubectl commands that the developer would normally have done. And the way this is done is that NSX intercepts those Kubernetes commands and it knows to create a router and it knows to connect all the bits up and do all the security and firewalling and all the other things around there. So we're not asking the developer to do anything different. If anything, we're making it easier for them. We're getting out of the way and just creating the bits that they need to do the job whilst uh, sticking to the policies, procedures or um, you know security um, directives from the IT department or the business. Next thing I then do is I decide to deploy uh, an Nginx uh, can, uh, an image into the foo uh, namespace. And when we connect those up, they automatically get a firewall attached to them that uses all the, again, policies that we've already set up before. 
Uh, and same again for bar, I'm going to deploy Nginx into that bar namespace. And as soon as that's deployed, it's going to get a firewall attached to it using all of the NSX policies we already have. So you can see that the developer hasn't done anything different here. NSX has, has intelligently seen what the developer is trying to do and plumbed everything together, including not just routing, but also the security and switching and all those other things as well. So we can even do NAT here as well. So you can see that we've not got in the way of the developer. If anything, we've made the life a little bit easier, but done it in a way that still adheres to uh, compliance and security standards for the business. So that was example number one. For example, sorry, I've got some more stuff to deploy here that attaches back to it again. But again, same way that we've done it before. Example number two is going to be a little bit more detailed, and this is the last example I'll give you. Any more than this, you probably need a bit more of a deep dive on uh, NSX, but this hopefully gives you a, a good idea how it all fits together. So I've got two physical routers in Active Active. I'm going to do two tier zero routers, and I'm going to do these in Active Standby. I'm going to connect everything to one tier one router and because i'm going to have multiple deployments going to a tier one router there really should be non-overlapping ip addresses it's not a really good idea to have um, the same ip addresses from different ranges and deployments connected to the same tier one router so we'll start here i'm going to create my first tier zero router um, and i'm going to create my uh, another t0 router so i've got two physical routers here and two tier zero routers there i'm then going to plumb that in to a tier one router an nsx t t1 and then what we're going to do is we're going to do some deployments underneath this so developer creates a namespace called foo and we've now got that foo namespace connected to that t1 router there uh, we're now going to create bar and you'll see this time the bar namespace is connected to the same tier one router so they're on different address spaces so a different subnet and when i deploy my images again Images are deployed, containers are connected to them. So this is just another example, two physical routers, two tier zeros connected to one tier one, and multiple deployments and namespaces are connected to the same T1 route. And you see we automatically plumb in all the routing and router advertisement. We automatically do all the securement security as well. And the developer just goes about the job the same way as before. They haven't had to run any extra commands or do anything else. We're just doing the plumbing for them behind the scenes. So in, in many ways, it's much simpler than what they had before. So again, that was a bit more of an introduction into how it all fits together. If you want more of a deep dive, you're probably going to need to look at some of the um, hands-on labs or training courses on uh, the VMware main website. But hopefully you found that useful. And thank you very much for your time.